Have you ever watched a ship glide smoothly through two continents, only to rise 85 feet above sea level and vanish behind massive steel gates? But how does a massive cargo vessel actually travel uphill and then back down again using only water and gravity? We took a trip through one of the most famous ship passages in the world to find out. From locking chambers to mechanical mules, join us as we explore the incredible process behind how ships cross the Panama Canal. It all starts off in Panama, the country where North and South America meet. At first glance on a map, the Panama Canal might look like just a skinny line cutting across the land, but in real life, it's a busy 50-mile-long water route where more than 14,000 ships pass through every year. And they're not just cruising straight through. Each ship has to go through a carefully timed process involving rising water levels, strong little machines called mules, and a whole system that moves over 50 million gallons of water just to make one full trip. So let's start on the Pacific side. The first thing you'll see is the massive bridge of the Americas, stretching across the canal like a welcome sign. As a ship heads in, it doesn't just float its way forward. There's a whole team making this happen, both on the ship and on land. First up are the tugboats. These guys help steer the ship into the right position, like giving in a nudge in the right direction. They're basically the ship's safety net, making sure it doesn't drift off course as it gets closer to the first lock. Once it's lined up just right, the tugboats back off, and that's when the canal mules take over. Now these mules aren't animals, they're machines, big boxy electric locomotives that ride along rails on both sides of the lock. Their job is to keep the ship perfectly centered inside the narrow concrete chamber. Think of them like precision spotters. If the ship drifts even a little to one side, it could scrape against the wall and do some serious damage. That's why big ships usually get eight mules, two up front and two at the back on each side. They all work together using heavy-duty winches to tighten or loosen the steel cables connected to the ship in real time. But here's something surprising. The mules don't pull the ship through. The ship's own engine is still doing the pushing. The mules are just there to keep it straight and steady. The first major stop on this journey is the Miraflora's lock. It's made up of two chambers and lifts the ship a total of 54 feet. And how does it lift something that weighs tens of thousands of tons? just with water. Once the back gates close, water from the nearby Miraflora's lake starts flowing in, all powered by gravity. No pumps, no machines pushing the water. It travels through huge hidden tunnels called culverts, built inside the locked walls and floor. In about 10 minutes, 26.7 million gallons of water fill the chamber, slowly raising the ship like it's on a gentle water elevator. The system is crazy precise. Ships up to 1,000 feet long can rise or drop with nothing but flowing water. No lifts, no cranes. That's because the lock walls have three enormous culverts, one down the middle and one on each side. From there, smaller cross tunnels run under the floor of the chamber and let water bubble up in stages. Huge valves control how fast or how slow it flows making sure everything stays smooth and controlled. Once the ship is lifted to match the next chamber, the front gates slowly open. But these aren't like doors you'd see on a warehouse or even a dam. These gates are massive steel structures, taller than a four-story building and thick enough to stop a runaway ship. They don't just swing open loosely either. Each gate has two leaves that close in a V-shape pointing upstream. And because the tides on the Pacific side can rise or fall by more than 20 feet, these gates are the tallest in the entire canal, built to handle the ocean's mood swings. After Miraflores, the ship travels a short distance to the Pedro Miguel lock. This one's a single chamber, but it still gives the ship a good lift, 31 feet higher to be exact. The operation here follows the same method, once the gates close, gravity-fed water raises the ship gently until it's ready to continue on. Now the ship's nearly at the highest point, just one step away from cruising above sea level. Then comes one of the most dramatic parts of the entire trip, the Gilliard Cut, 
also called the Culebra Cut. This is where the canal slices right through the Continental Divide. It's a narrow, carved-out stretch lined with steep hills and incredibly tight. So tight, in fact, that large ships can't safely pass each other at normal speeds. Once through the cut, the ships sail into Gatun Lake, a man-made lake that looks calm on the surface but plays a massive role in how the canal works. It stretches over 20 miles and sits 85 feet above sea level. The lake was created when engineers dammed the Chagray River, flooding the valleys and turning it into the canal's main waterway. But it's not just a route, it's the essential link between the two oceans. If you're learning a lot from this video so far, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. Every ship that crosses the canal sails through this lake under the watchful eye of a Panama Canal pilot. These pilots are specialists who board each ship before entry and take over navigation from start to finish. After crossing Katoon Lake, the ship approaches the final stage, the Katoon Locks. These are the locks that bring the ship back down to sea level. There are three chambers here, and together they lower the vessel 85 feet. Just like before, the mules return to keep the ship centered. But this time, instead of filling the chamber with water, it's all about letting water out. Water drains by gravity through the same network of culverts under the chamber floor, lowering the ship step by step. No pumps are needed, just gravity and a carefully timed opening of valves. Here's something most people don't realize. Every ship that crosses the canal uses about 50 million gallons of fresh water in the process. And none of that water is recycled. Each transit pulls a fresh supply straight from Gatun Lake. One last gate opens and just like that, the ship exits under the Atlantic Bridge, officially completing its journey from ocean to ocean. From lock to lock, the entire transit typically takes 8 to 10 hours, although that can vary depending on ship traffic, weather, and other logistical factors. From a pilot's first handshake to the last gate opening, it's all about timing, coordination, and sheer engineering brilliance. Now let's take a step back and talk about how this was all even possible in the first place. Construction of the canal began in the early 20th century, but the idea had been around for centuries. The French tried it first in the 1880s with a sea level canal, but it failed due to engineering problems, landslides, and rampant disease. When the United States took over in 1904, they brought a different plan, a lock-based system. It was slower and more complex, but it worked. Work on the locks began with massive excavation. At Katoon alone, engineers dug through 5 million cubic yards of rock. Then they poured over 2 million cubic yards of concrete to build the lock chambers. To move that much material, they used overhead cableways, railways, cranes, and even custom-made cement mixing machines. By 1913, the locks were ready for testing. The very first vessel to transit a lock was a tugboat named Katoon, and it made the passage flawlessly, even though the controls were still operated manually. Every chamber is made of concrete and steel. The lock walls are up to 55 feet thick at the base and taper as they rise. The center wall between parallel chambers isn't just a divider, it houses tunnels for drainage, electrical wiring, and operator access. In fact, there's a whole control room built right into this wall, where operators manage the entire process with models and interlocks designed to prevent mistakes. For example, it's impossible to open the wrong gate or valve because the system physically won't allow it. Originally, the locks were built with auxiliary gates midway through the chambers. These shorter chambers let smaller ships transit without filling the whole chamber, saving water. Back in the early 1900s, most ships were under 600 feet long, so this feature made sense. Today, most ships are much larger, and the auxiliary gates are rarely used. Speaking of size, the original locks are limited to vessels no wider than 110 feet and no longer than 1,000 feet. These ships are known as Panamax class, but by the 2000s, global shipping outgrew those dimensions. So in 2007, Panama began building a third set of locks as part of a massive canal expansion project. Completed in 2016, 
The new locks, called the Agua Clara and the Cocoli locks, accommodate ships up to 160 feet wide and 1,200 feet long. These new Panamax Giants can carry almost three times as much cargo. Unlike the original locks, the new ones don't use mules. Instead, tugboats guide the ships through. They also feature water-saving basins that recycle about 60% of the water used in each transit, a crucial innovation in a world of changing climate and water scarcity. And while we're on the topic of safety, the canal was built with serious backup systems. Every upper lock chamber has double gates, two separate sets spaced 70 feet apart. So if one gate ever fails, the second would stop the flood. In the early days, they even installed emergency dams and fender chains designed to stop runaway ships. Most of those features were eventually removed as the system proved so reliable. But the basic rule remains, two gates between you and disaster. So will the Panama Canal keep adapting to the demands of modern shipping, or will new trade routes change everything? Only time will tell. If you found this video interesting, check out the next one for more behind the scenes looks at how things work. The one we posted just before this might surprise you.